Zeppelin. Hi there, this is Jimmy Page. Hold on to your seat. Here comes Led Zeppelin. I'd like to introduce some friends of mine to you. Would you welcome Mr. Robert Plant? Quite a day for everybody, and a very good day too. Okay, any requests? Any requests? Just a moment, just a moment. We have a bit of business first. Before we begin talking about chucking televisions out of hotel windows and Moroccan opium dens, you need to read the liner, Jimmy Page. This DJ is insane. Just read it. Good morning, this is Jimmy Page. Come on, it's time to wake up and get the lead out. On the channel that rocks your ass off, the Bayou Acrimony channel. If you can tell the mouse who's sitting on the floor to stop squeaking and we can get everything very quiet, we'll manage to do it. Tell us how this project got started. When we uh, decided to get back together and see what would happen, Robert had, uh, I think prior to that maybe, had called uh, Martin Massonnier. Um, in, in Paris, who made up some loops for us of uh, North African drums, some tape loops, which was, uh, you know, pretty evocative stuff, really. And uh, it was good to be working with this, with the, these sort of rhythms, which didn't involve like an, a normal drummer as such, with bass, drum, snare, and hi hats, and all this sort of thing. And it, it was it was pretty instant, actually, as far as you know getting inspiration from these things because that's exactly what they were inspirational and two two of the numbers which are, which were employed on this um, um, on this TV show uh, were t two of the things that with the tape loops that we did at that time wonderful one and and yellow um, and anyway we went on from there to work with uh, the rhythm section um, Charlie Jones and Michael Lee that had been with Robert for what two years I think mm. isn't it yeah um, and we wrote stuff there and then but then then we started to embark upon this this uh, course of action so to speak by bringing in uh, you know Moroccan drummers and 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 electric hurdy gurdies and and um, sort of reinvestigating yeah. the old numbers and but new I think the, yeah I think the loops really were. <laughs> Word gave us the green light. Well, good evening to y'all all. I tell you one thing: we've got to get these lights down. So it's it's pretty pointless us bringing our own lights if we got these things going on. Mr. Cole, can you take your dress off and get these lights turned down, please? Tell us how Kashmir has now evolved into a new song and how being British you're influenced by the music of Mother Africa. And do tell us more about the wonderful Martin Massonnier. Massonnier is a, a French producer who's produced people from Iggy Pop to Sheb Khaled. He's a, he's, a, he's a good guy, crucial guy, married to Amina, who's an excellent Tunisian singer, who's had a lot of relatively cross-the-board pop success in Paris, France. And... Um, because of his links with Amina, he was invited to the University of Tunis and he was introduced to the head of music there, who virtually opened every single door for him to go exploring um, the sort of vast varieties of musical differences in Tunisia. And, and all across North Africa, you've got this incredibly vibrant music scene that's really exciting. If you can imagine Broadway uh, 59th Street, uh, you know, every street, Barry, Bronx, or every street pumping out music at every street corner, loud as loud as can be. That's what it's like in a, the average get down Medina area of a North African city, where you've got so much music and it's really vibrant and it's happy and it's chattery. And really, he'd been exposed to that and he'd developed a lot, he got a lot of drum stuff. And I thought that the best thing that we could do, Jimmy and I, is to start without the confines and the constrictions of a rock group situation and just see what we can do. And, as, and we'd both finished projects, so we were both free at the same time to explore um, together in the future tense. And the, the drum loops really were, they were like a kind of third party that didn't speak. 
So we were there in a room with this tape loop and with a huge PA, and just we just turned the whole thing on, and and it was a bit kind of a bit odd and uncomfortable-ish because we hadn't really our communication had to be built primarily on on a future, and so we knew that if we couldn't write, we didn't have a any career really together. Because there's no point in going around and and having a huge sort of stadium Rolling Stones type of deal. Because I got you know there's nothing wrong, nothing against them, but for me and for Jimmy too, we had to actually expand and it, and develop. And I think the thing with Kashmir was that although you say it was an established, Kashmir has always been from the day it was recorded to three months ago. It's always been the Kashmir that you know. But from now on, it will be known to be something different, and the new Kashmir is definitely an improvement on the on the one before, because it's been thought about and expanded. It's more of a challenge to uh, take things further, and that's exactly what we wanted to do, and have done. Yeah, we could. Ex we knew that the part of our the stuff that we'd written together actually could be expanded and could be repainted. And, and coloured differently, and it would be a benefit to the songs rather than just an extravagance, you know. And um, and it was just a uh, just a case of figuring out how to do it. And once we got got an intention with the specific songs, then really the songs almost gave themselves to the new approach. Thank you. Well, listen, we got two problems. We got three poor policemen here trying to do their duty, so let's. Why don't we all sit down? There's people in the gangway there. Then these guys can cool it and dig the show too, eh? I mean, everything's cool, but if you people in the gangway just sit on your arses and let these guys come back here and dig the show, right? Now that's pretty reasonable. It's what they call live and let live. The second problem is that it ain't going to get no darker because the guy who's working the lights he's a bit like this, you know? <laughs> but the third thing is that this is a song about getting, walking in the park and you've got a packet of cigarette papers in your pocket and some good stuff to put in it. I've got my room. I've got my hotel key here. What a jazz. Can you hang on to me key, Phil? Phil! Oi! You have pisses. Pop out of this. Talk about how the local musicians contributed to the music. Everybody from Michael and Charlie, the rhythm section, to Nigel Eaton, the hurdy-gurdy player, Paul Thompson from The Cures joined us, the Egyptians, Hussam Ramsey, all the people around, Najma Akhtar, the Indian singer, everybody has kind of added their enthusiasm to it because I guess if we were at the, at the actual base of it, at the root of it, Jimmy and myself, then I think the music encouraged the people so much that their contribution really developed it. Mm -hmm. And they were actually really, I mean, it was very, very inspiring the way that the, the Egyptians really took to the songs, knowing nothing about us at all, and nothing about anything, you know, apart from, and nothing, they knew nothing about the effect it may have to listeners or anything like that. They just liked the songs. It yeah. became a real great experience, very joyous. I once. I once heard a song called uh, The Witch Queen from New Orleans. Well, tonight, after we've been together for about five and a half years, I'm pleased to announce that John Bonham, Moby Dick, is the queen of New Orleans. John Bonham, Moby Dick. Tell us about these girls, these howling Berber girls from the Atlas Mountains. There are really a couple of things that, um, that aren't on the film or anything that will probably come to light later on, within the next 12 months. Well, we brought these girls, these Berber singers who are called, they, I said to Mustafa, the translator, I said, these girls, what, because I, I like Berber female singing because it's so upfront and it's so <clears throat> outrageously, it doesn't have any sort of problem with itself, it just comes out and howls. Mm -hmm. I said to Mustafa, what are <coughs> these people? He said, ah, these are called the free people. And they are Ber they are Berbers from the n from actually north of the Atlas, near not far from Fez, but they've never been controlled by anyone. They're like a sort of tribe of Berber who uh, 
who've never succumbed to anybody who passes through, never the Arabs nor the French nor anybody at all. But they howled and they were howling. I was singing, Jimmy was playing the guitar and the Ganawa were playing and we were doing all this, it was like a spontaneous, it was like three or four express trains crossing yeah. each other. Rhythmically, the, everyone was doing these it was so, counter rhythms and yet it, you know, the I mean, whole train of it was wonderful. It's really out there, but it's not... I mean, you can't put it on a record, really. It's just wild. And, you know, I mean, there's a place for it. Mm -hmm. But um, but I think it's probably better to watch it to get the plot because of the kind of anxiety. Because the girls were there and they wanted, they wanted to succeed, but they didn't know what to do. And I was saying, imagine that you're singing at a wedding because... When they have when the weddings are a phenomenal celebration, and so they started howling and hooting, and I started singing a kind of blue shuffle across it. Yeah, it's great. I mean, it's not. And the Ganawas, whose his music is so melodically and harmonically sm smooth and sweet on the ear, sort of raised their eyebrows oh, they and they went for it. <laughs> yeah, they didn't like it at all because they were going. Not so they, much. There was obviously <laughs> something going down between the, the uh, Ganawas because the Ganawas are like healers. They're, they're Sufis. Yeah. And, uh, and this, yeah, these women singing this dissonance, you know, and it, it was great. You've been to Morocco before and it wasn't about music, right? We'll save talk of the opium dens for another time. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, we yeah, travelled a lot, I'd, I'd, we? Yeah, yeah. travelled with Robert there and then I've been on separate occasions since that point during the 80s. Um, but this is the first time that I've actually uh, done anything musically there. I mean, there was one time when I went round there with her tape recorder and stuff that seemed to have got sidetracked into other areas at that time. That's a life. very nice way of putting <laughs> it. That's a great way of putting it. I think I was there too. I think we went all that, that was thousands of miles ago. and went without a mains lead. <laughs> That's right, something like that. Did you find it liberating to play with these unusual tribal rhythms? It was inspiring, that's for sure, in every respect, both with the loops and with the canals. Mm. They, they so. say that everything begins on one, so if you've got a four-beat bar, it's, it's always one that starts everything off. <clears throat> and so that you get the polyrhythms rhythm, and cross-rhythms, it becomes like flamenco, southern, the music of southern Spain, which is so related to its... I mean, when you think that Spain was occupied by the Moors up until three or four hundred years ago, and then they all escaped and came down into Morocco, down into Fez and Mar uh, Rabat, and had their centres of their music. And it was a very serious culture. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, it was, esteemably, it was far ahead of England, I think, in its oh, yeah. in culturally happening, mm. you know? But it was just that the Spanish princes won it all back and slung them out, but they took the music mm -hmm. and they left the music. So you got that kind of rhythmic thing and that wail of flamenco, the flamenco yeah. vocals that you hear. In Certainly in, in the vocals, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, amazing. Tell us about those Spanish cave singers. There are, there are places in, uh, in Granada, in central Spain, where there are caves and you can... There are guys who sing into the cave. You must know about this. The singers who just... They get onto the edge of the cave and they just sing into it because the acoustics are amazing and their voices... You remember that, just this is something as hard, do you remember when that, that sort of Moorish content within the culture? Remember when we went to see that football match in, I think it was in Ibiza, wasn't it? We went to see a football match and the girls started oh, yeah, chanting yeah. up and you could just hear it. There it yeah. was, this, this Moorish content in just, right. in just a little chant that they were doing to support their team. Yeah. You know, it's And it's always there, like a... It's a really... Uh, well, you know, it's not self-conscious at all. It's like just primal stuff. Yeah. The thing is that music still, like it was 200 years ago, um, uh, it still carries the same intention. You know, you've got, you've got itinerant musicians who travel around anyway. Mm. Just as much as you've got storytellers. Yes, right, yeah. All the rest of it. And know. then you've got the, the musicians who, who are... the village musicians who are used for marriages or, like, bringing the crops in and stuff like that. I mean, the actual idea of a pop star... It's a pretty new situation out there. You know, I mean, Umm Kalsum, the Egyptian woman, has been... She sang one line so convincingly that she had to repeat it 52 times. And every time she did, you know, they sing, they have the orchestra playing and she'll sing something, and then the audience went nuts because of the way that she put it over, like, 
Elvis or Bono on a good night. But the crowd go nuts and say, OK, sing yeah. it to us again. Yeah. And so she puts a different inflection and a bit more... Ah, and, and again and again, and in the end, like, it was just... She had to keep... They wouldn't let her carry on the song. She just had to keep singing that one line. Their music is so beautiful. Do you incorporate Arabic into your lyrics? I've been trying to make it a part of my style where appropriate. The only thing is, that with our music being... I can't include it in a line of a lyric yet. I can only use it as a kind of punctuation at the end of a piece, mm-hmm. of a line. I want to try and make it part of the me- melodic structure of a song, rather than just a sort of afterthought like a ooh yeah of a blues thing or a Ray Charles shout or something like that. And maybe I can do that, but I... It's yeah, but I remember when I saw you in, in, in Boston at the end of one of these one of the numbers, and I can't remember what it was, you did one, some of these great trills, you know, Arabic trills, and I said to him, hey, that was great, and he said, yeah, I've got a lot of that inside me. That's right, yeah. <laughs> and he was right, you know. Well, you know, Najma, the, girl, the Indian singer on this project, she's, she re- rehearses, she practices... It, it's very serious, the Indian thing. It's far removed from the North African job. But she practices against rags and weaves so much of her voice into these amazing areas. And it's quite amazing <laughs> that at this point in my singing time that I've got now so much ambition to expand my ability. You know, and tr- I mean, I'm really pleased that I've got something that I've got to try and learn to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which I can't do just like that, you know. I could learn to sing like, like a, a Western singer, you know, like people learn, mimic other people. But uh, this is different. Talk about the music scene in places like South America. Before we got together, I'd I'd been, I think the, Fate of Nations tour. I played, throughout Eastern Europe. I played 21 countries in nine months, and uh, ended up in South America. Um, and it was quite interesting to to see just how big the Led Zeppelin thing is down there. And when I played, there were like 60-odd thousand people or whatever. And Poison was one of the support acts. And it was, such, it was so amazing to watch how rock and roll or pop, the American pop thing, has changed because there was such a glut at one time of people, of bands, who went, that's a good idea, we'll do this. And that whole process now seems to be exhausted, you know. Um, and even the Brazilians have got Pantera or whoever it is. They've got their... their yeah. All these countries now in in Hungary and uh, where I played and, and in the Czech Republic, they've got their own heroes now, so the kind of international rock god is starting to dissolve as other countries get a plot. Mm-hmm. And as they get a plot, they, they, it becomes more their own. And they've got their own national identity, which is great, you know. So the song Nobody's Fault But Mine came out of recording Gallows Pole. We went to, to, to Wales, really, down in the slate quarry there, to, to do, um, to do um, Gallows Pole. And we, we, we had a couple of, you know, uh, takes of Gallows Pole, and then we just started jamming. And in fact, that that came from a jam. It was no more structured than just jamming. No. It really was it. No, it. So it's just one of those things that came out that way that day. Another day, it come out somewhere different. But even still, you can leave the bottleneck behind. <laughs> yeah, but I think what was great about it was it reminded me of um, when I was a kid. I was really into uh, Sleepy John Estes, and that, yeah, at that yeah. time it in the late thirties, like yeah, actually. there was Yank Rachel on mandolin and Josh Altimer on piano, Ransom Nolan on bass. Mm. And John Estes playing, and they did all that stuff like Milk Cab Blues and Drop Down Mama, and loads of Led Zeppelin songs. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and you could hear that kind of sloppy vibe about the whole thing, which right. makes Nobody's Fault But Mine a real triumph on the film, because it really is. It's just right in the pocket. Talk about the band from the Welsh sessions. The great thing about it is, is that working with those guys who we hadn't really had very much to do with, but the, on, the, on the Gallic side of things. It was anybody's game. We let the hurdy-gurdy sort out the drones and stuff and give us a bit of melody, mm. and then we give him free range and free mm. wrist to do stuff. And, it, and really, I mean, the amount of jams and tapes I've got of stuff in between rehearsals are... They're actually hit singles. Yeah, unbelievably commercial. Yeah. 
which are on cassette, which are, apart from all this stuff that we've written with Michael and Charlie as a four piece, I mean, it's amazing because the more people you bring in, the more of a celebration it is. Mm -hmm. And they really wanted to work with us and they coloured our music. Yeah, the good thing about, for instance, nobody's fault but mine was that it took on its structure as it was being played, you know, and it's, it started to be mutable mm. within that, 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 that shape. How did you work out the arrangements for Friends, Four Sticks and Kashmir? During the point where we, you know, the point of rehearsals with, um, with Friends and Four Sticks and, and Kashmir, we were actually rehearsing with separate... You know, we, we, we did some stuff with the, uh, with the Western Orchestra um, and, 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 you know, got some string arrangements and changed those around. Then we started working with the Egyptians and, and, and moved things around there. And maybe a couple of rehearsals, th three rehearsals into it, into the Egyptians, they actually came along with uh, something that they'd written as an introduction to Friends, which I thought was really, you know, it was really, you could see how, how they'd been caught up in the spirit of the whole vibe. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't until the day before, even though one had a really good focus of what was happening, it wasn't until the day before we, we actually shot this whole thing on video that we heard the whole thing in its entirety. And, oh yeah, well it was really, so it was a bit, you know, it was a bit dangerous. Tell us about the violin solo on Kashmir. I do really hope that, uh, that this comes across to an audience in America that's so used to having sort of malleable, pop-formulated music rammed down its throat. Because, I mean, that violin solo is so un unreal. It's absolutely fantastic. Yeah. The man is playing for himself, for his style, for his culture, for his country, for his life, and you can see it all, mm -hmm. you know. And such a nice guy, but he, man, it's so beautiful. Everybody who sees it goes, wow, where did he come from? Yeah. And he plays nightclubs in London, starts at 4 a.m. and plays until 9 Jeez. to Saudis. Yeah, and hates it. But they usually can't yeah. wait to get down there, though. Let's go to the club. Yeah, got to go to the club. Well, in their eyes. It's either that or go if home. We haven't been to the club to witness this. We didn't have time. We were doing other things, but we kept promising to go. But I wanted to see what it was that brought the twinkle in their eye, apart from the music. Because <laughs> there was something else there, man. Yeah. <laughs> and it wasn't the wife. <laughs> no. Talk about the string arrangement on Since I've Been Loving You. We have to say that Ed Shermer, who plays keyboards and was in charge of string arrangements, we discussed how to do Since I've Been Loving You, and, and we were talking about things like The Thrill Is Gone, where B.B. had a sort of small string section, but it did the job. I mean, it's we went over the string arrangements for this, like I said, when we were routine with the Western Orchestra, and we heard what he got together, and then we went... It. Yeah, that's right, then, then we sort of finessed it. Just recently, uh, we had a new album out, which seems to be doing quite well. Thank you very much. Uh, there's a lot of people that we could dedicate it to, but I tell you, New Orleans would be one of the places, definitely. We've had a fun... We've been here... Listen, whoa, 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 whoa. We've been here for about uh, three days on and off, you might say. Uh, it's been a gas. Do you feel as musicians you have remained relevant? Well, we've had our ups and downs, playing-wise. Uh, <laughs> I think, it's fair to say. Um, I don't know, because some people get so blasé and it becomes so so much of a, not a chore, but an easy an easy dollar, that they lose the fire, you know? And maybe if we'd have got together two or three years before, it wouldn't have been right. Mm -hmm. I mean, right now, it seems by... I don't think we've ever individually even tried to take it easy, though, have we? No. We've always pushed ourselves to as far as we could possibly go. To go over the horizon. We'd like to really thank you for making this, for your faith in making this the biggest thing that's ever happened in New Zealand. How did Yala come about? We just, we literally just, we started the the loop. The loop was playing through the PA, and we just went out there. We were actually, we were going to do a little sound check, and then stop and start again. But we didn't. We just did it. We just, just went for it, and that was it. it was that was a one shot. It's, you have to get the, the picture that the Dejma Elfman in Marrakesh is the square, one of the most renowned squares in the whole of the world for storytellers, soothsayers, musicians, 
jugglers, fire eaters, blokes with snakes. I mean, the whole place is like a mayhem of of uh, artisans of one kind or another, or philanderers trying to make a, a dollar. And I've been there that many times and been intimidated into emptying my pockets of dirham <laughs> to cough up to these. Because as soon as the musicians are playing, they've got kids, and they spot a tourist, and they just give the kid a nod, and the kid runs over with a hat and, uh, you know, asks for money and stuff. So we thought we'd reverse the process and take our loop and our music and set up and play and see if we could get any dough out of them. <laughs> we got a lot of claps. <laughs> yeah, but there might have been people going around with hats, you know. I should think Rex was, yeah. No, I mean the local, the local oh, uh, people maybe going, on there. going around with the hats, you know. Yeah. And I'm sure there was a bit of that because at one point, you see, we had these speakers up on stands with the loop coming through mm -hmm. and, 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 and the PA as such, the vocal. And one of these speakers, well, the, the speakers started to move <laughs> back into the audience and... Hurriedly, people ran in and rescued it, you know. So I'm sure if a speaker was going to disappear and be sold off at the other end of the, of the square, some stray, stray hats went around, who knows? Yeah, yeah, as, you, as you've been so, bad luck. Yeah. Do you actually know what you're saying when you speak Arabic? I know enough Arabic to wind people up a bit and get them clapping louder. I don't know how I learnt it, but I guess I always wanted people to clap. What a sad boy. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I'd rather have a scotch now than talk about it, to be honest. But, um... <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, I'll go there enough now to know that I want to communicate. And the more you can communicate with people in their home, in, in their natural tongue, the more responsive they are. And they're very, very nice people, Moroccans. They're, um, and they're really keen for you to get into their vibe, you know. So, yalla basically means, you know, this is it. Let's go for it. And as soon as you sort of... And, of course, I was using my own system of echoplexes, which were two distortion repeat pedals uh, with the batteries failing, going through an a, a Vox AC30. So the voice was pretty distorted. And if I hit the button, I could get the repeat to repeat to repeat to, re to loop. It was um, great, because all, all, all this great rhythmic stuff going on, what with, with that going and, and, and the echoplex and the loop, there's all this wonderful swirling stuff and... And then, you know, the, the the actual ambience of the people clapping and cheering, and it was great. It was better being there than watching it on the field, yeah. I'll tell you that. Yeah. Can you imagine? You but play, it was great to have done it and pulled it off, though, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, it was, it was, you can't say it's nerve-wracking playing in the largest car park in the world, but it certainly had a certain but they atmosphere. Could, you, know, you never knew they could have just turned around and wandered off and listened to yeah. some, somebody playing his bicycle down the road. That's right. <laughs> We were being upstaged by some Sudanese drummers who were... Those blokes playing that, those drums. Yeah, but apparently they started joining in on the rhythms, didn't they? they? <laughs> yeah. Do you feel people are really going for a primal, tribal kind of music? I think it's always been there, really, hasn't it? Yeah, I think... It's, it's just that the focus might be a bit different now, but it's always been there, the tribal thing, yeah. surely. It Absolutely. Might go way, way back. That's where it works in, in North Africa, is because it still relates to the people who are watching it. Rather than taking them into some fairyland, um, but even I don't the, know. Maybe we've yeah, seen the end even of the birth of fifties rock though. That was tribal in the way yeah. that moved, you know, communicated across. That's right. So it's, it's, it's I think far away. That's from why us. the loops are so successful because mm. it's uh, you know it's sensual. The repetition, the, the Ganawa thing is is rep it's built on repetition constantly, going round and round and round. Yalla, I mean, yeah. It's another start, isn't it? Sure. Tell us about No Quarter or the French Quarter. It's just an, uh, an idea of uh, kind of kicking the film off with something that was adamantly and, and, and without question nothing to do with an unplugged situation at all. In fact, it was taking the human voice and distorting the hell out of it and churning it up and actually making the lyrics of No Quarter and the, and the whole sort of complexion of of reintroducing people to what Page and Plant wrote and sounded like. It's kind of saying, hey, and it's just a little bit dark and a little bit... You can you can think about this a little bit and say, what is it? It paints yeah. a picture without it just being a lyrical exercise or a bit of showmanship. Let me tell you, we've been here so long. I mean, 24 hours in one place when we're touring is a long time. 
And we've been in this town so long, it's like we get nervous playing in your hometown, you know? <laughs> I think Jimmy's just bought Bourbon Street. <laughs> this is what we've given and this is what you've given us. It's called No Quarter. Why are there only two ex-Led Zeppelin members on this project? I mean, the input, uh, you know, we can reach conclusions musically and decisions very quickly. Because, you know, I mean, the, just the two of us can work it out very fast. And, uh, and we don't have to patronise each other or, you know... I mean, it's just a decision is, is a decision, and I think you can get to it real quick. You can cut a lot of the sort of pleasantries out and say, yeah, that's good, or no, that's not. Yeah. Just by having it one-to-one. -one. John Bonham! John Bonham! John Bonham! Moby Dick! John Henry Bonham! Tell us about the vocal effects used on No Quarter. Oh, that's because it's going through that old grey boss chorus pedal. Hmm. See, well, it's a boss, but they're very yeah, early. It... Yeah, whatever. Yeah. So it's very flanged. John Bonham. John Bonham. 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 Let's talk about this new version of That's The Way. It's a group rendition now with bass and drums. Yeah. And, and banjo. And... Uh, it's the verses are more or less as they were, but the, but it lifts a lot more at the obvious points where people come in. You know, I mean, it's like a, a musical opportunity, if you like, as opposed to a photo opportunity, which we can't wait for. Um, it's so the whole thing lifts up. It's quite animated, as a matter of fact. I was quite against singing it. I said, no, I don't like those lyrics. They're too naive and sort of, uh, I suppose, adolescent or whatever. Yeah, but uh, it sounded so good, it didn't really matter. And then, uh, then I realised that the naivety of the lyric made it even, it made more sense. Robert, darling, talk about your duet with Tori Amos. I was asked if I would do a song, and I said, yeah, I'd like to do a duet, and um, and I'd like to do Down by the Seaside, and I'd like to do it in E minor, and I'd like to do it as slow as humanly possible. And. Uh, I've met Tori a few times, and I really, really, really love her. And so we, she flew into London, you know, typical pop stuff, left Italy, flew to London, would leave and go to Germany. And we just busted it for about half an hour and played it. I played guitar, and she played piano, and she, sat, she got the best out of the session. Michael and Charlie played uh, brushes and upright bass, and it was really... I think it was upright bass. It's so cool. But it goes on a bit. It's like seven or eight minutes long. So we're so proud of this mix. So it really is good. Yeah, it's good. And uh, I'm really proud of my guitar playing because it's really <laughs> fractured somewhere between the solo of maybe Down by the River, Neil, Neil Young, that, all that kind of real awful fracture. And it's great. And then we got a call from New York saying, we love the tune, but do you mind editing it? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well, oh, God, where would you begin to start putting a knife to it? It's, like, amazing. Well, it's a bit long, you know, they said, because, um, you know, we've got to fit it in with Rollins and um, four non-blondes, or whatever it is. Were you guys able to get the howling Berbers in the studio? It was just the luck of the draw, to be perfectly frank. It, we just couldn't find enough Berbers. <laughs> I mean, if we go back there... We didn't have enough time to no. work with the Berbers properly. We only had a short period of the time women there in which to come out with whatever, you know. And we, 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 we were discussing, we were discussing with you earlier, weren't we, about Berber working women. with the women. Yeah. But that was with the Ganawas as well. If we'd have worked with the women on the road, we might have come yeah. across something. But as it was, we just didn't have time. But it's always a possibility of the future. You must be aware of the, you know, the um, on Real World, there's a CD called Sources. Mm -hmm. which, you know, the Peter Gabriel thing. But not the Peter Gabriel thing, but the one where there's Nusrat, Fatih Ali Khan and Dida. I think track eight is a Berber wedding track. Yeah, and yeah. if you listen to the drum intro on that, and, and that whole thing, that's where we're going next, into that vibe, <laughs> yeah. I think. Because yeah. the drums... I think, you know, this whole thing about the drum and the, the, the chant and the, and the sort of mantric tribal thing, 
if we can make the most of that, it really brings out the best in us two as, as writers instantly. Mm -hmm. So the Berbers are holding their breath. Mm. Unwittingly. <laughs> <laughs> Jimmy, let's talk about the equipment you used. I use a Les Paul a trans performance guitar, although it looks, as people have heard so much about this trans performance guitar, which changes pitch and everything and changes tunings. In fact, it's just sort of put into a tuning and it almost looks, I looked at it and I thought, oh my God, people are going to think that this is all overdubbed. In fact, what it is, it's a, it's a wah wah. I mean, um, a, wha a whammy pedal doing it all on the, on, you know, from the foot pedal. So, in fact, where the fingers aren't doing it, anything, and it's all coming from there, I thought people are going to think this is overdubbed, you know. But anyway, so there was that. It, by pure nature, the fact that we were going to be working with all these um, string players, um, you know, the Western and, 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 the, and the Eastern, Middle Eastern ones, um, that somewhat posed a problem with amps. And... Uh, I, in fact, I used um, a, F a Vox AC30 mm -hmm. and a Vibrolux. And that, what, that aspect of it, because of the way that we just went for it over those two nights, I think my sound wasn't as good as what I would like it to have been, but it doesn't matter. You seem to have found the, the, the North Sea has been hiding in the equipment all the way here. <laughs> <laughs> Bernard! <laughs> Well, with every concert that reaches the size that the, this, um, they reckon this was going to reach, there are, are a lot of problems. And uh, I'm coming from Bombay, I'm trying to ignore the jokers, I'm coming from Bombay at the same time. Uh, we don't know what these problems were, but um, when we... <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm from Bombay, not Birmingham. Now, uh, anyway, it's all it's all very fresh and very new, so this is one called Dazed and Confused. <laughs> This entire project started out as an unplugged album, but tell us how that changed. Basically, because it was, you know, it's proposed that we, we did an unplugged. Um, and I suppose that, that was the thing that got us talking. And then the loops got us working. But by the time we actually applied ourselves to the overall project and making it sort of work and getting numbers together, I mean, it was totally plugged by the end of the day you know there wasn't anything that was unplugged i mean the, uh, stripped down to its you know to its rawest i suppose is do that there's there's no quarter which is basically very electric um yeah thank you good evening <laughs> It's all going to come, right? Oh, right? That's for the man over there, because you have no voice there. We got um. Oh. What? You got the haircut and growing the beard, look. That's that. <laughs> uh, the point is, we've got an album coming out in two weeks' time. Yeah! Oh, yes. Yeah! Thank you. And uh, on this album, there's a few acoustic things. And we'd like to uh, try and do one for you tonight. Jimmy Page. Musicians like George Harrison have talked about how much they dislike some of the early CD compact disc releases, saying they are too crisp and don't have the warmth of the analog formats like vinyl or cassette tapes. You had the chance to remaster some of these Led Zeppelin early releases from the Studio Masters. Yeah, actually what happened was that Atlantic put out the CDs and in the past I'd always been in charge of, uh, you know, mastering the records and uh, 
And there were a lot of... Some of the CDs didn't sound at all up to scratch to me, you know, they just didn't sound right. And uh, uh, this gave a really good opportunity to uh, get it right. You know, get the sound right on them, improve them, by going back to the original uh, Studio Master tapes, that sort of pre-production tapes, uh, wherever possible, that is. And, uh, and then, because, uh, but by nature, the fact that it was a four-CD package, to represent them in, an, in, a different, uh, in a different form. So it became like, you know, the old picture with a new frame. <laughs> And uh, it's, 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 it's really interesting, actually, because it sheds new light on everything, I think, you know. Where were some of these tapes stashed away? Well, they were all over the place, <laughs> really. <laughs> really, it was a treasure trove trying to find them all. But uh, fortunately, we were reasonably successful with that. I had some in uh, my own possession, but then other ones that were supposed to be in, like, security archives... Uh, some of those were there, and then you find some somewhere else. But uh, the ones that I handled personally were where they ought to be, so that was fortunate. What was the most difficult part of the project? I guess the hardest part was um, getting the running order to, to go across the four CDs and, you know, taking tracks from the, all of the uh, nine albums that would be, wouldn't it, really? And, uh, you know, interlacing them and, uh, and make, you know, getting them to all feel comfortable and being comfortable with them myself, you know. What's the difference between these versions and the original releases? Well, the clarity, obviously, is going to... Uh, is enhanced. That's the major point of it. But I think the key to it is the, is the new running order as well. That, that's the thing that we really... Um, I think people find uh, most exciting about it, I hope. It just sheds new light on it and, uh, you know, that's... Uh, that, that, I think that's going to be the, the interesting thing in, in, in retrospect, you know, to see what people's reaction is to it. I think it'd be pretty positive. Absolutely, man! We seem to see uh, 22,000 people sitting down. So, uh, we're going to sit down. <laughs> For anybody who keeps shouting out about other numbers, you've got to put you straight from the word go, you see? We, uh, we have this go, we have this sort of thing all over the place, and we, what we like to do is to do as much as possible in the time that we've got. So, please don't shout out, because we come into it eventually. There's a bullfight over there. Yeah. I'm watching an American voice. Sit down, you guys. Sit down, man. Sit down, far out, man, really. <laughs> so we come from New Zealand, so good evening. <laughs> Do you have some old, unreleased numbers left over? We didn't have any, um, any sort of uh, golden nuggets left, so to speak. Everything that, we, that was uh, left over after, since, uh, in through the outdoor, and after we'd lost John, uh, that was completed. In other words, with vocals, etc. You know, and uh, maybe they needed a, a remix or whatever. But uh, they came out on Coda, and that was in light of the fact that there have been so many bootlegs out, uh, countless more now, as we all know. But at that time, so many bootlegs out of live performances, and we thought, well, it would be, you know, a good idea just to put those things out then. So in fact, they went out on Coda as opposed to coming out on this. So in fact, there wasn't any uh, studio material left. So. Uh, as these things had sort of surfaced and been played apparently on radio stations over there, we thought we'd include them. We had uh, Travelling Riverside Blues, which uh, had been recorded for uh, the BBC many years back, 69 and 70, and uh, it actually sort of surfaced. It surfaced during the last tour that I did. As I was doing sort of radio interviews, people were saying, and what about this? And they'd play it, and uh, they'd say, was it an outtake from the second album? There was a big theory that that's what it was. So, uh, and, you know, as it was around, there was a lot of interest. We thought we'd put that on. And then, of course, there's the, uh, the White Summer, which, again, was done on uh, a live broadcast with... Uh, well, we did a whole set at that point, but we just included that one. Let us take the New Zealand Railways. <laughs> what was the food like on those trains? 
Uh, can I tell you um, where we come from? Um, we started all this trouble a long time ago. I think somebody invented a kettle that, with a lid that went up, up and down in the air. <laughs> well, we've had no success ever since that kettle, really. Nothing runs on time, no food. You can't eat nothing. And, uh, and thank you for catching the train, man. <laughs> Do any of the songs that have been re-EQ'd stand out? I think they all benefit from the, from the new EQing, actually. You know, it just makes them crisper and, uh, you know, there's more space to them. I mean, there's, obviously there's numbers on there, for instance, um, Achilles' Last Stand, which sounds absolutely fantastic, it sounds phenomenal. And that's a number that I think, uh, you know, it, that, that, that was sort of uh, missed by a lot of people, really, because uh, presence wasn't necessarily very, you know, uh, wide selling or whatever album, you know, it wasn't sort of, uh, it's pretty well received by people that I've spoken to, you know, but it didn't sort of sell, in, you know, in the volume of, for instance, previous albums. Uh, and that sounds really great, you know. So Elvis Presley's Baby Let's Play House got you into rock and roll. I was, I, I was really uh, seduced by rock and roll at an early age, that's for sure. But that was a record where I listened to it and I thought, wait a minute, there's just a, an acoustic guitar, an electric guitar a bass and a voice and it just sounds, you know, just sounded so dynamic that, uh, yeah, I, that's the point when I started to try and get this uh, instrument, this instrument that I had at home uh, into some sort of shape. You know, we had, we had a guitar laying around the house, it had been given to us by somebody, and I don't even know who it was who gave it to the family. we have been sitting around for years. And of course there wasn't anybody who could really sort of play in those days, you know, I just fortunately happened to find someone at school who knew a few chords, and once I got the thing in tune and learned a few chords, and I went on from there. What was your vision when you put Led Zeppelin together? Did you bring a vibe from the Yardbirds? I had it in my mind exa exactly what, what I wanted to try and get together, and then it was just a matter of, of searching around for the right personnel that could, that could pull it off. Um, by that I mean, you know, for the sort of, the sort of w work that I'd managed to expand around the Yardbirds material, because there was a lot of areas in there for improvisation, and I'd come up with a lot of riffs of my own, and ideas, and you know, passages and movements and things. Um, that, along with uh, the incorporation of the acoustic work, you know, this was the idea of it, um, along with the blues, etc. So, my first choice is either Steve Marriott or Terry Reid. Uh, Steve Marriott was uh, was already involved in something. Terry Reid, who actually was my, was my first sort of choice, actually, uh, actually put me on to Robert. And uh, Robert had been playing up in the Midlands, and I don't think he played down in the South, so consequently I hadn't heard of him. And once uh, I heard him sing, I was pretty impressed, to say the least. And I invited him to come down to my house and spend some time down there, and we'd discuss exactly what was, you know, what the plan was, and see how he, how he could get along with it. And he's reasonably mutable, so it worked. And he, and he, uh, although I, I had in mind a, re a very powerful drummer, um, you know, I wasn't ready for John Bonham. I must say he was uh, beyond the realms of anything that I could possibly have imagined, you know. It's absolutely phenomenal. And still is. I mean, his work's just incredible, isn't it? And, and, and actually, it was during this point of me going around and seeing Robert that Jonesy called me up and said, I hear you putting a band here. There's all this nonsense about ads in the Melody Maker. is absolute rubbish. He actually called me up and uh, said, I hear you getting a band together. You know, I'd like to be part of it if you consider me. So I said, all right, well, we'll all get together. And we got together and had a rehearsal and... We didn't look back from there. How long did it take you guys to record Led Zeppelin 1? The first album took about uh, 30, 36 hours or something like that. In hours, in actual hours. Obviously it wasn't, you know, go in the studio and work for 36 hours. It was over a period. But when it was all added up, it was that, you know, that amount of time. I mean, I knew by the studio bill. <laughs> uh, but but we, had, we had actually um, played these numbers um, uh, live because there were a few dates to fulfil from the uh, Yardbirds and we went over and fulfilled those and uh, went in and recorded and then of course we changed the name. What was your first American tour like? We went over to the States to support Vanilla Fudge 
on a tour and, and that's when things started happening over there. Well actually, you know, it was great, you know, receptions to what we were doing there because obviously I've been in the Yardbirds and I guess people were really curious to see what, what was going to be coming, you know, and, and it's well received but it was when we actually went to San Francisco that, uh, that it really took off because uh, we were supporting Country Joe and the Fish and I think Taj Mahal was on as well. And I mean, it was just like dynamite. Who threw the firecracker? And you weren't locked up. You would have been locked up. Jimmy, talk about being a producer and the studio techniques you came up with. Backwards Echo was one that I invented at the time. I know the engineer said it couldn't be done. Well, I knew it could be done because I'd actually suggested it before on a Yardbirds track. And I said, why don't you try this idea, and it was backwards echo, reversing the tape, recording the echo, and then putting it round on the right way again so that the echo would precede the signal. And the engineer, Glyn Johns, at the time, over the first album, he's the engineer for the first album, he said, this is impossible, won't work, it's impossible. I said, well, you do what I'm telling you to do, just do it. And, of course, when he... We put the tape round the right way again and played it back. He was grudgingly moving the fader up, and you could hear this fantastic sound. It was a, it, it was only really employed on the, on that album on the end of uh, You Shook Me. What is the most satisfying thing about Led Zeppelin to you, cats? The most satisfying, you know, it's the most rewarding part of it as for me talking about it and how it's effective. Having you know been part of music like that, which which has stood up to the test of time. I think every musician hopes that their music will hold up and uh, let alone uh, having been part of a fabulous band as well and to the bargain, you know, it's wonderful. Let's hear for Jimmy Page. A nice one. Robert, tell us about Led Zeppelin's first rehearsal. I remember the little room all I can remember was it was hot, and uh, and it sounded good. Very, very, very exciting and very challenging, really, because I could feel that something was happening within myself and to everyone else in the room. It felt like, uh, I don't know, we just found something that um, we had to be very careful with this thing that we'd found because we might lose it. But it was remarkable just the power. What American musical influences were rolled into Led Zeppelin? Well, we'd pick out all the records that more or less formed the basis for Led Zeppelin, the first Led Zeppelin album. A lot of Howlin' Wolf, Muddy Waters, Robert Johnson, Joan Baez, Larry Williams, a lot of rockabilly, Gene Vincent, stuff I talk about when I'm talking about my own career and why I still do what I do. A lot of stuff left and right from of center, and I took a load of Moby Grape stuff, the first two Grape albums, and uh, Forever Changes by Love, or oh, a lot of American West Coast stuff, which really had caught me and saved me from ending up being the typical English pub singer, because I found that in, in California, or the Californian musical scene was at least the spearhead or the, or the great indicator of how music should actually have some bearing on or at least some little pointers and indications on, on actual social behavior if you like and social awareness so I came loaded up with that and Paige was playing blues and rock and roll and it was, a, it was great if we did nothing else that was really good. Led Zeppelin replaced Jeff Beck's group for their first US tour. Yeah well Jeff he wasn't really consistent about his playing you know isn't that a nice way of putting it? He'd run away a lot. And, and quite rightly so. I mean, some people like it and some people don't, playing on the road. But um, anyway, whatever happened, happened. And we ended up in Denver, 26th of December, 1968, with a silly look on our faces. And, uh, wow, it just happened. Robert, what are your feelings today about the first Led Zeppelin album? If I'd have been a little more relaxed and a little less intimidated, it would have been, for me, it would have been that much better. I'd have sung the same songs with the same phrasing, but I would have sung them, I don't know, a bit less nervously. It's just that, like, the performances aren't that great. The records are super, you know? They're all good. There ain't a bad record. 
but uh, it's just when you look back, you become very analytical, and when you analyze an entire piece, then it's usually something to do with the mood that you're in, mm -hmm. or or the conditions that you work under. Mm -hmm. And I was very intimidated. I I don't know. I mean, maybe I had a complex, or maybe I was just neurotic or paranoid or something like that. But I thought this is all too much. Am I really here? Do I belong in this sketch? And so really, the the record feels like that for me, for my contribution. But it really, as a as a collection of tunes and a way to play and expand, it was great. Describe the Led Zeppelin stage show for us. The element of risk was the great thing about it. You know. In, in certain areas within the, sh the set, we knew that there was going to be excitement factor, where we are going to try and do something that, or go somewhere, which we hadn't plotted at all, hadn't planned, and that, and see if we could get out of it. Well, in the end, we just kept getting out of it and forgot about the music. Did all of the individual band members have their own unique areas of expertise? Not really. No, it was all... But the great thing about it was it was always an opportunity for somebody else to contribute uh, from another direction. Bonzo came up with riffs by singing them while he was playing odd drum patterns, and Jonesy would uh, come up with great stuff. I think Jimmy was more studious, if you like, and worked much more at home on things and uh, gave it much more long-term period thought. You know, I didn't really do that because I, I, could, I w didn't really play anything. And I didn't really want to. I didn't want... When I was doing it, I was doing it. And when I wasn't, I certainly wasn't, you know. I couldn't go around like some... I didn't feel that I had to go around with a cloak of endeavour around my shoulders all the time. Robert, talk about the recording of Led Zeppelin II on the road. When we were in L.A., we wanted to try and use the studio Gold Star, which Phil Spector did his early, most successful stuff with that huge wall of sand. But they'd taken all the equipment out, and Gold Star was, I think, where Cochrane did some of his stuff. And uh, so we ended up going to Delphi Studios, where Chan Romero and Richie Valens had recorded, and we did some of, I think we did Moby Dick there. And then we did a Ramble On in New York, bit to bring it on home in Vancouver, I think. Thank you very much. Why did you go to Wales for inspiration on Led Zeppelin 3? All we wanted to do was keep stretching. This is the whole thing about Led Zeppelin, or about Jimmy or myself, or anything that happens. John Paul too, he's, he's composing some quite remarkable music in England in a different field. Um, and we wanted to try and uh, stretch it out and open it up and change, just shock ourselves to see exactly what we could do. So we set off uh, in a jeep with Stride of the Dog and uh, the t some kids, two women, and a gypsy bodyguard. We just started trying go going back into more of an acoustic vein. It wasn't an area that we hadn't touched because your time is going to come, babe, I'm going to leave you all. And the, the total awareness of, or not total, but just being exposed to the incredible string band and. Roy Harper and all that sort of stuff around, which was music for the head, which was coming from more acoustic based. And uh, that's what we did, you know? And I think it was a great success. The least successful Led Zeppelin album, and, and with the critics screaming for our lives and blood, saying, what's this crap? It was probably one of our finest moments. And the fact that we deemed that we had to do it at all is a fine moment. And this is a thing called Ron Ra. Now, Ron Ra is the name of a little cottage in the, the mountains of Snowdonia in Wales. And Bron Ra is a Welsh equivalent of, uh, of the phrase golden breast. This is so because of its position every morning when the sun rises. And it's really a remarkable place. So. After staying there for a while, and deciding that it was time to leave for various reasons, we couldn't really just leave it and forget about it. You've probably all been to a place like that. Only we can tell you about it, you can't tell us. 
Tell us how Houses of the Holy came together. Houses of the Holy was really probably one of the, I think it was really a very inspired time because I think the material is very much to the point. It's, uh, it's very focused and strong. Uh, I think the crunch was great. Rain song was really good. And I think there was a lot of imagination. And I, the, I prefer it much more than the fourth album. I think it's much more varied and and it has the flippance with stuff like Jamaica, which showed up later again in Through the Outdoor with stuff like Hot Dog, you know, where, and Candy Store Rock on Presence, which was a complete sort of me trying to be Raul Donna or Elvis or whatever, just like on Nirvana now or Hurting Kind, you know. Um, uh, I think it was a very successful time and things like Jamaica we were going for an ultimate drum sound there was a track by D.D. Warwick called Foolish Fool on Phillips that was a minor hit in a uh, black hit in Detroit around that time and we tried to get the drums to sound the same as on her record she was Dion Warwick's sister hopefully still is and it was a great record really good very proud of that great a great time and uh, and it was quite smug, the fact that we'd done Hazard of the Holy as a song, but we put it on physical graffiti. It was all as usual tweed, English schoolboy tricks. You've been to Morocco before, and it's not been for music, baby. How did that influence the lyrics on Kashmir? Following the 75 tour, Jimmy and I, uh, we finished off, after playing in America, we played for a week at Earl's Court in London, which was quite a, an achievement. And uh, we just had to get away, so we went to Morocco. It was great to get away, and especially as Jimmy, I don't think he'd been to Morocco before. It was good for me to show him places that I'd been to, and the kind of, and the kind of hubbub of Marrakesh, the chaos. And then we headed south into Tantan, towards Tantan, which is where the the edge of the Spanish, the Mauritanian Spanish Sahara War with Morocco had been was later to go on. And somehow or another, the, the lyrics to Kashmir developed along that road somewhere. Talk about the musical influences that went into Travelling Riverside Blues. Travelling Riverside Blues, when a man gets personal and wants to have his fun. When I was a kid, and I used to go to all the folk clubs and the, uh, listen to people singing unaccompanied vocal work, rather in the lines of sort of English folk song the derivation of English folk song, the unaccompanied coal miner from Durham wailing away about the blokes making all the money and he's not getting any. And then you had the Woody Guffrey element, the kind of Americana with the the Jack Ka Kerouac existentialist sort of movement. So you've got all this kind of blues stroke, folk stroke jazz, which I was a little young to be really comprehensive, have a comprehensive schooling on it. But I was just about old enough to look like I could get into these clubs because they served alcohol. And I got in, I used to sit at the back and listen to all this stuff. And I was weaned and drawn into blues. And uh, on June the 20th, 1937, in Dallas, Traveling Riverside Blues was first recorded on Columbia. And it says, if a man gets personal and wants to have his fun, best come back to Friars Point, Mama, and barrel house all night long. Now, the idea of that... It seemed much better than chartered accountancy. Mm -hmm. The idea of some troubadour going up and down the Mississippi River, getting off on, at the landing and playing, and really having a good time, and being kind of not a modern highwayman, but like a, it's not even the, the, the bard who goes from, from court to court and sings the praises of the king and then moves on safely. Uh, it's just the idea of this guy getting away with it. Now, Robert Johnson didn't get away with it forever. He was murdered. This song we got to uh, dedicate to a guy called Frank, who's the owner, member, manager of a good club in town, not far from Conti. This is a song about the fact that you can go right the way around the world. You can go to China, Japan, Bangkok, India. Everywhere you go, Everywhere's the same. The people are all aghast. How would you like Led Zeppelin to be remembered in the future? I'd like to maintain the dignity of the group. I'm very proud that people are so uh, enchanted by it. And I think the way that it is now is that whatever it was that people loved is not going to be spoiled. 
Uh, and I think the fact that Led Zeppelin was bold and brave and chaotic and honest in a very loose framework. It was honest and it, it took risks and chances which are no longer possible if you start from scratch. Um, I think its integrity musically, it, uh, it captured all the elements of, one, of the kind of wondrous music that we'd all been exposed to. I think what we did was we were able to translate and kick on. It's like, you, you know, it's like we were a filter for all the good things. We filtered it and we begged, borrowed and stole. And we made something that was particularly original, by which a lot of other music has been measured. On organ once again, John Paul Jones, featuring the organ of John Paul Jones. John Paul Jones's organ, anything. John Paul Jones, what got you into playing bass guitar? My father was a pianist, and uh, we used to go out gigging, and... Uh, well, he, he originally wanted me to take out the saxophone because um, he said that the bass guitar would be a, just a passing sort of fad. <laughs> and he said, <laughs> you should take out the saxophone because you'll never starve, you know, one of those. And then so I didn't want to play the saxophone, I wanted to play the bass. And then he found I could play, and um, so he said, all right, you know, good bass, bass players are hard to come by, so off we went doing sort of weddings and masonics and... The usual run of things. Talk a bit about being a session musician and, and drop some names. Everybody. In England there was no, there was no speciali specialization. So you, know, you don't have like a, a country session players or rock players or pop players. Everybody does everything. And in those days uh, the session scene was, was very, very large and active. And one would do, I've done, well, like Rolling Stones, Everly Brothers, uh, French rock and roll sessions, German ones, um, Engelbert, Tom Jones did, did all his stuff, and Lula, uh, everybody, I mean, you just literally, and all in the same day, quite, off, quite often, yeah. How did you get into arranging music? Uh, the only real um, impetus I had for arranging was, was panic. <laughs> I, I put my hand up, you know how it is, somebody says, can you do any arrangements? Yeah, sure. <laughs> and then, <laughs> as the session gets closer, you know, you get a book. <laughs> and <laughs> try and work out what goes where and that sort of thing. And after a couple, you find, you know, you're an arranger. It uh, happens that way for a lot of people, I think. What do you remember about Led Zeppelin's first rehearsal? We first played together in a small room in Gerrard Street, in a basement room um, in what is now Chinatown. And it was just wall-to-wall -wall amplifiers, you know, just marshals, sort of. And there was a space for the door, <laughs> and that was it. And um, literally, it was just everybody looking at each other. So, what, what should we play? <laughs> and uh, me, being doing more sessions, didn't know anything at all. So there was an old Yardbirds number called "The Train Kept a Rolling," which Jimmy said, "Well, it's just like it's in E, and you go down, dig it, down, dig it, down, dig it." Right. So, three, four, 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 and wow, the whole room just exploded, you know. Lots of uh, silly grins and, oh, yeah, this is it, man, yes. Yeah, so, <laughs> you know, it was, it was pretty bloody obvious, actually. <laughs> it was, it was going to work <laughs> from the first number. Where did the name Led Zeppelin come from? The name Led Zeppelin was um, coined by Keith Moon, which was originally going to be <laughs> for a band that recorded a thing called Beck's Bolero, which was Jeff Beck, Jimmy Page, Nicky Hopkins, myself, and Keith Moon. And we did, I think we did a couple of tracks, actually. Well, that and the B-side. <laughs> and, uh, and then the thought of it all going on the road, I thought, was a sort of fairly horif horrific. Um, you know, quite a bunch of characters, as you could probably imagine. And so that, it, that never came about, but um, we remembered the name and uh, asked if he could use it. Describe the band's stage set. As far as st structuring the, the stage stuff was concerned, certain songs wouldn't really change that much, but other songs would really have points where you could, anybody could do anything. We used to, we used to call it the band of nods in those days, because you could just, one nod, 
and <laughs> and we could just go play something else, start a blues or start a country piece or start a, you know, a bit of James Brown or something like that, and then everybody would follow and until that idea had run its course, and then off it would go somewhere else. You know, there were several songs that we could do that. We allowed ourselves the space to do, and that that was really good, really enjoyable stuff. How'd you set up your keyboards? A nightmare. I had a Hammond organ and a Mellotron. Oh, a Mellotron. Um, you would just approach, there was one song we saw, the, the Rain song, which was just start off on guitar, and then the, f the next thing you would hear was strings on the Mellotron. And I used to just approach this thing with the greatest trepidation and fear. So when I put my hands on those keys, what is going to come out? <laughs> Will it be in anywhere near pitch? <laughs> Will it be at half speed? Will it be a, a string sound or a flute sound? Oh, it was, it was I was just, and, you know, as the thing used to heat, because it, it, it was um, a system of tapes, literally tape loops. And it was all mechanical, there's plumbing inside of it and everything. And, you know, as the gig would heat up, the tapes would start stretching a bit and the motors would slip and, oh. It was, I spent my, my entire technological career trying to replace the Mellotron. I went all over the world looking for things to replace the Mellotron. And I did, you know, by, even up as far as um, 1980, where we actually took a fair light on the road. John Paul Jones... What was it like being very low profile and in Led Zeppelin? The main advantages were that nobody knew what you looked like. If I got to a city, I could just go out and walk and generally see, you know, see the sights and get around. Whereas Robert is just so recognisable. You know, he, he, they found it hard to actually leave the hotel without causing great trails of people. You know, you can't sit in a restaurant or a bar or anything. But, uh, but I used to get away with. Once I'd slipped the security, especially in later years, you know, just creep out the back door and just get out on the street. So, yes, it had a great advantage for me there, which is how I prefer it. Thank you. John Paul Jones was the orchestra. Just showing you what a white piece of wood can really turn out. Why did you use mobile recording facilities in trucks? Just like the idea of going somewhere to write. It, it, it was a focus, really somewhere you could go and write and then when you were ready to record wheel in a truck and do it that way rather than be in a place where you write and then go to a place where you record or being in a place where you record trying to write which is the worst thing and the most expensive of course and studios aren't really con that conducive to making music good night new zealand and thank you what do you consider to be one of the best moments of Led Zeppelin? The early Boston Tea Party concerts were, was the biggie, really, for us, and we really knew it, had, it was working. Plus, it was the longest concert we ever did. We played four and a quarter hours, I think, which, with an hour and a half act, is some going, I can tell you. We played four nights at the Boston Tea Party, and the last night, we just... I think we did the act twice, and then we did everybody else's act. <laughs> we, did, we did the Beatles songs and Stone songs and Who songs and everything. It was really good. It was really steaming. Thank you. We'll see you again. Led Zeppelin studio techniques for recording in houses. We used to try everything. I mean, basically, if you're a guitar, bass, and drums band, you've got to come up with something a bit different each each time, so that all the tracks don't sound the same. And we used to have amps everywhere, and in rooms, up stairwells, and bathrooms, and outside we've recorded, and you know, just yeah, we were. We worked with good engineers, too, who would be prepared to <laughs> put up with all this stuff. Again, uh, one of the advantages of not working in a recording studio all the time is if you were in an old house, you could find a cupboard that you could stick a, a guitar amp in. Or in Headley Grange, uh, like the, the, the sound which wrote the song, really, of um, When the Levee Breaks, 
that whole song just came from the drum sound because we'd set him up. We were doing another song and there was a lot of leakage from the drums. So we set him up in another room, in, well, in, in the hall. Uh, like um, there's a big stairwell, it's about 30, 40 foot high. And there was, there was one mic, there was two mics on the drums, one at 10 foot and I think one at 20 foot. No bass drum mic. They were both above him, up the stairs. One on, basically one hanging on the first floor and one hanging on the second floor. <laughs> and that was it. And he, and he just started playing. I said, Jesus, will you listen to that sound? And then, I can't remember who started the riff. That's how that song came about. And so, yeah, through experimentation. Thank you very much. Good night. Good night, New Orleans, the best city in the state. Good evening! New Orleans. Thank you.
Maybe we'll see you next year. Good night. This is Jimmy Page, and I want to hear some rock and roll. Right on, man. Easy. This has been a Bayou Acrimony presentation, darling. <laughs>